Good afternoon from New York. My name is Dan Kaplan, Executive Editor of SC Magazine. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to today's webcast, Database Monitoring in SIM, Beyond Compliance to Data Breach and Fraud Detection, sponsored by Nitro Security. Uh, today's webcast is going to examine how database activity monitoring and security information and event management can be integrated to help organizations meet compliance demands, but perhaps more importantly, defend against data breaches and corporate fraud. Uh, and there certainly has been no shortage of data loss incidents in the news this year, as you are probably very well aware of. Nary a day goes by without some sort of headline uh, detailing some breach conducted for some motivation. And it's really gone to the point now where preventative solutions, while still important, really can't be relied upon uh, to solve the problem. And considering the sophistication of today's adversary, organizations certainly uh, must uh, employ more defensive tactics. And really, uh, we're at the point now where they have to assume compromise. So that's where tools like SIM and, and monitoring can come in to provide visibility and allow organizations to uh, react quickly and accordingly to these breaches. So that segues me over to introducing our speaker today, Mel Shakir, who is the CTO of Nitro Security. He's going to take you through a presentation today, and then Mel's going to turn it back over to me, and we are going to host a Q&A for about 10 minutes or so at the end. Uh, so please keep those questions coming in as we move along, and hope you enjoy it, and I will turn it over to Mel now. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us on the webcast. I'm Mel Shakir, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Nitro Security. I've spent about 15 uh, years in information technology, and 10 of those years have been in information security, and a good portion of that has been focused on database security. I am also the Chief Architect of the product NitroView Database Monitor, uh, we often call as NitroView DBM. So our topic for today is database activity monitoring, uh, or DAM for short. Uh, beyond compliance to data breach and fraud detection. We'll start off with a brief primer on database security, uh, but my main focus uh, during today's presentation will be to share my experience and industry trends with you. Hopefully that will help you make good choices with technology selection that's right for you, ensuring that database security fits nicely into the overall security program within your organization and provides benefits beyond just compliance to proactive information protection. So anyone who has dealt with uh, database security uh, will appreciate it's much more complex than securing a device or an operating system. There are many aspects to securing a database. Some institutions uh, have data discovery programs underway to find where the sensitive data is that needs to be protected. All it takes is a few acquisitions and a few layoffs before you know that there is a system out there with sensitive data that nobody effectively owns. You can use database crawlers to find sensitive content in tables, or you can use network discovery features in DAM products. You know, scanning databases for vulnerability, vulnerabilities is mandatory. Many, many companies use homegrown scripts for VA. Uh, some DAM vendors provide free utilities. But there are leading database VA solution vendors out there as well. The idea behind these preventive controls is to determine the risk posture and harden your database. So for example, knowing the patch level, uh, which reveals whether the attack and the exploits make the system vulnerable. Predefined queries against the system tables you know, can help determine unnecessary users and privileges and help fix the access controls. Now with respect to access authorization, you know, you have many choices. Uh, you have native database authentication, which is internal to the, the database, or you have external authentication at the OS level using LDAP or Active Directory. External authentication, which is ticket-based, AD or Kerberos, is typically a better choice. Internal database authentication techniques are generally weaker. Uh, some platforms and version, even the recent versions, they tend to use clear text passwords, or they have simple hashes which can be easily sniffed and cracked over the network. Well, another area of protection is encrypting data at rest. Uh, this is usually limited to sensitive columns like SSN or credit card numbers to limit the performance impact. And to be honest, I've seen encryption at rest being used in less than 10% of all our customers' environments. 
although encryption in motion is starting to get a bit more popular. For example, uh, even vendors like Microsoft, since SQL Server 2005, they've at least started to encrypt important things by default. For example, the authentication packet which contains the username. Then we also have secure backup management, securely copying production data to development environment using data obfuscation, leakage prevention, database firewalls. These are just some of the preventive controls for securing the data in a database. Okay? And then uh, we have the monitoring controls, which we'll be discussing in quite a bit detail today. So hopefully you can agree that it is not as easy to secure a database as it is to secure an OS or a network device, and you're going to need some planning. Okay. Now, the primary challenge, uh, you know, there, there are different kinds of challenges you're going to be facing. And the primary challenge is that the data is, is not static in a database, right? By nature, it's constantly changing and it's relocating. It's being accessed by applications. It's being replicated into environments. It's being copied to development and QA. It's being backed up to the disk. It's being exported to the desktops. And many of the primary controls we talked about earlier help us deal with some of these challenges. But there are other set of challenges uh, that arise because of sheer volume of the auditable data in the database. So if any one of you has had experience with dealing with firewall or domain controller logs, and if you think that the event rate is high, wait until you actually deal with databases. And of course, there are database servers that don't have a very high rate uh, of volume. Uh, so Typically, you know, when I run into a situation or a database environment where uh, they, don't have a, uh, they don't have a sense of the event rate, you can, while sizing a deployment, dam deployment, you can probably use 100 or 200 queries per second as your thumb rule. Now, some large web portals, for example, they can have tens of thousands of transactions per second just on a single massive 12 or 24 CPU cluster database server. And then there's the sheer volume of the database servers in an organization. For example, on Wall Street institutions, it's not uncommon to find a few thousand database servers. Uh, but let me tell you that even monitoring even a few dozen database servers gets challenging without a proper tool. A database server is a critical piece of computing infrastructure. And they not only store sensitive data, but they are the engine behind the critical applications whether it's a trading application in a financial institution, it's a backend to a website, a healthcare, manufacturing, or it's a billing application. One thing we all know, that they are critical. We hire DBAs just to manage them, and we who spend bulk of their time fine-tuning and ensuring the database servers perform optimally. So now turning on auditing in the DBMS to the levels required to meet security and compliance can have a damaging effect. And you will always find resistance from the DBAs uh, if you ask them to turn on native auditing, which can sometimes impact you know, 30% or 40% additional uh, horsepower uh, on the database servers right off the bat. And even more, if you want fine-grained auditing. Okay? Now, if you change, now if you choose to use agent technologies to monitor databases, you have to deploy agents and then manage them. And when, there is, when the vendor issues a patch or an update, you have to run it through your change management process, then update all the database servers, and then the vendor sends you another patch. And it starts to get unnerving, uh, which is the management part. Then you also have the other architectural issues that you must confront. You know, applications use connection pools for optimizing the application performance. And the service account, the same service account is used to connect to the d database server on behalf of the app, all the application users effectively hiding their identity uh, to the database. Now, although there is no one trick pony in trying to figure out who the application user was in a multi-tier connection pool environment, there are many tricks that you can perform that you need to be aware of. Okay? Uh, now, these are only some of the technical challenges. Uh, then you have the constraints that the DBAs cannot be monitoring themselves because it violates basic security principles of segregation of duties. This means someone else other than the DBA or the application team that do not know anything about the database or the application now get the privilege of monitoring your database. 
And in most cases today, that privilege goes to the security operation center or the information security team. And I think it is a natural choice and a good choice, uh, but there is some education involved there. Okay. Because the dam vendors now have also made it much easier to monitor a database. And usually it's a simple tutorial or a little bit of help helps the SOC and the InfoSec guys overcome their fears about applications and databases. Now, I also want to talk to you a little bit about some of the industry trends. The rise of the application security officer. Now, this role, uh, we are starting to see more and more within the organizations, uh, and the idea behind this is to bridge the gap between the application team and the information security team bring in the folks that understand the business application really well. And another thing that we uh, see a lot is the tools are now allowing the subject matter experts to participate in the security process. So until yesterday, the security team was operating within its own, own little universe. But now, as the subject matter experts, the application developers, the people who own the business, they start participating in the security process through the products and the tools, and the tool over here, and uh, the one that we are talking about is the SIM tool, uh, they start helping the overall security posture of the company because we have now experts participating in the security. Okay. But there's one question, uh, or one question rather, for the DBAs, that even though somebody else will be monitoring the database, they cannot be oblivious to database security because DBAs will most surely be answering questions in the event your environment gets breached. So it is very important for you to understand how the security is implemented, how it is architected uh, for your database servers. Now here's how uh, the database monitoring typically gets uh, installed within an organization. It usually happens in the form of phases. Uh, in phase one, most people are you know, deploying the firewalls and the antivirus and the perimeter devices um, to protect the organization. But in phase two uh, and phase three, they start deploying a SIM solution to bring in the data from all the operating systems, all their IDSs, IPSs, uh, um, and all the other security products, network uh, products, into a single console so that they can effectively understand what is the state of affairs in my organization right now. And uh, SIM vendors like us, have included database monitoring as part of the SIM portfolio, so you don't have to worry about phase two and a set third phase where you bring in a, another specialized vendor just for database security, but it is built into the SIM as part of the solution. And usually we see fourth phase as being, uh, you know, once I have secured and brought in the logs from all the different sources, how can I prevent leakage? So we typically see these four. Uh, sometimes they may be swapped around one way or the other, but this is typically the deployment that we see. Now, with respect to a database, uh, you know, uh, here are the few top security threats. Um, uh, many security risks today are a result of being behind with patch deployments, people abusing their rights, uh, or the lazy Joe just assigning all privileges uh, to a pesky user. But SQL injection is a legitimate and a huge concern, and so is the exposure of database data that's no longer in the database. So it has made its way outside of the database in a, in a backup or in a development system. Now, let's review the top use cases for people who buy database security solutions. What are their primary concerns? And even the product demonstration that I'll do later on is going to be based around these top use cases. So let's start first with Privileged user activity monitoring. And I would like to say again, user activity monitoring of privileged users. This is the, probably the topmost use case. Uh, the next one is, of course, the database protection, ma making sure that the integrity of the data that's in your database is preserved. Uh, the third against the misuse of the data that's in your database. And finally, an understanding of you know, who uses the sensitive data, whether there are business processes that require that use or whether they don't. Uh, you know, discovering that uh, information is critical. And a fifth important use case is the speed of uh, reducing your cost of breach notification reporting. 
So when there is a breach, and we all know from Verizon Report and others that the databases are the, one of the most likely things that uh, the hackers are after because they hold the keys to the kingdom. So when the environment does get breached, knowing exactly what got breached, being able to report upon that and get that information quickly reduces your costs associated with that as well. Uh, it can actually be uh, uh, a good thing to know exactly the level of damage because uh, you may or may not be subject to stringent levels of reporting uh, if you have all the details. Uh, and a very simple use case here is, you know, in, uh, in HIPAA, uh, in high tech, there's a rule which says that if more than X number of users' uh, data has been breached, then you have to report back to prominent media like CNN or NBC or the others. So knowing exactly how many users' data got breached is a very important metric as well. So I'm going to run through these slides real quick. Um, uh, this one shows you, you know, how we typically do privileged user monitoring. Okay, so we have a user, you know, Jay Smith in this case, uh, who may be a privileged user, and he's accessing the database. Uh, but he's a privileged user, and most of the regulations, like PCI requirement 10, they require to log everything that the privileged user is doing. So the entire audit trail, right from login to log off, every single thing about J. Smith needs to be logged uh, somewhere. Okay. Now the next use case is uh, about database protection. Let's take an example of a brute force, right? Somebody's trying to break into the database, and what do they typically do? Whether it's an internal user or a hacker uh, trying to get in, uh, they're going to try to get the password using tools or uh, social uh, engineering. Uh, so they're going to typically have a lot of fail logons, and you know, following the fail logons, they may have a successful logon. Uh, that is their successful brute force login. And what a typical dam would do is it will look for these patterns, failed queries followed by or failed authentication followed by successful authentication from the same user and the same IP address, and that's a correlated rule. Uh, which you you know, uh, which you send a notification out to the security team. Here's another one, uh, you know, with respect to database protection and uh, going more into details of a SQL injection scenario. Uh, so a simple network like this, right, which has a web application, it's very simple for an external hacker to spider your web application using, you know, well-known, uh, easily available tools like, uh, you know, Python script, for example, SQL map. It's a very powerful script that can allow you to spider into your web application. And once you have succeeded in getting in, you can inject SQL flaws uh, into the database. Okay. This is just one simple example of how people would possibly get into the database. But once they're broken in uh, and they've injected malicious data inside the database, an unknowing user, you know, who is simply selecting through his application certain records in his database now has abnormal links back to a malicious website. Okay. So now he's not even clicking on a website or an unknown website, he's clicking on his own data, which has been manipulated, and it's uh, going to make him do harmful things. Okay. And when your browser executes, um, uh, you know, for that fraction of the second, all it takes is a click on the data, and you have been exploited. Okay. So monitoring of SQL injection attacks, we're going to look at that in a little more detail, uh, is going to be very, very critical. And what does that entail? You know, if you want to monitor SQL injection attacks, you have to be able to monitor every select query, okay? So for people who come back and tell me that we're going to monitor DBA activities and not everything else, so for example, uh, you know, the create tables and the drop tables and the add store procedures and the kind of DDL activity that the DBA does. I always tell them, you know, what about all the important use cases around SQL injection, right? Uh, and we're going to see a bunch of other important use cases today as well around response monitoring and sensitive data monitoring. None of that is possible if you don't monitor every single query that is going to the database. And not only the query, but even the response of the query. Now that means you could have a significant impact if you're running it locally on the box. Now here's an example of you know, how we build rules in our system and other uh, users can build and customize rules around fraud detection. Uh, you could have a very simple rule. Uh, this is a very simple example wherein a user uh, you know, accesses more data from the system than he usually does. So if the result set 
has credit card numbers or social security numbers or something important, but the return row count or the result set has exceeded a certain size, you can easily set up a threshold and create a notification. Uh, this is the simplest form of fraud detection. Okay. So now I want to get in, you know, now that we've seen the five use cases uh, and we'll be looking at the product demonstration in a little while in the form of screenshots, I want to get a little bit into the architectural discussions as well uh, in terms of what really works in terms of database monitoring. Okay. There are different kinds of solutions out there. Uh, you know, one of them, of course, is uh, an agent-based solution. So on the top right, you see with every database server that you have, you could deploy an agent. Uh, that is one, one way to do it. And the second way to do it is, uh, you know, to deploy a network-based monitor. Now, there are advantages uh, on each side, but the network appliance, uh, in my view, has more advantages. Uh, first of all, the segregation of duty. It is an appliance that a security team can easily buy and deploy in their environment uh, without any problems. Uh, and it's deployed on the network, so it does not, there's no changes needed on the application or on the database server. There's no performance impact. When you start dealing with agents, you'll have, there'll be a lot of other things that you'll have to worry about. You, the most important thing, of course, is going to be the performance impact on the database server itself. And the DBAs are going to give you a hard time with that. Uh, their agents are always hard to deploy because it's something you have to do on every database server. Of course, you can roll them out, uh, but you have to manage them. And every time the vendor makes a change, you have to redeploy them. Uh, in terms of scalability, uh, there's a limit on the scalability as well because by nature of an agent, you know, once you deploy an agent, where, are, where is it consuming its resources? It is consuming from the database server host. So no matter what the architecture of the agent and agents can have many different architectures. I'll talk about that as well. No matter what the architecture of the agent, it still consumes resources from your database server box. Okay, so the argument that the, my agent consumes less and your agent consumes more, it's all bullshit. The other thing is depending on the kinds of architecture that the agent uses, the logs may be, could be dramatically inferior. I'll give an example. Uh, there are some agent architectures that use, that monitor the shared memory. Okay, the argument there is that, uh, you know, the DBAs don't have to deploy it. We are just monitoring all the queries that are passing through the memory. Now, in that scenario, uh, the agent is essentially pulling the memory of the database server. Okay? And if the database server is faster, very well configured, it will probably miss the queries that are passing through the shared memory to the database server. The other things that are not in memory, for example, uh, you may have the query, but you don't even have whether the uh, information, whether the query succeeded or failed. You don't have information on the response of the query. You know, what did the query return back? What are the credit card numbers in the response? So monitoring a shared memory uh, may be uh, an argument, but it's, it's not an argument without, uh, uh, without its negative uh, effects. Or, and then there are other uh, agent architectures as well. Some of the agent architectures use native auditing. Uh, we'll talk about the pitfalls of native auditing as well, wherein you instruct the database server itself to create an audit trail. It suffers from some of the same drawbacks, uh, but you are guaranteed of uh, getting the query that was run against the server. So in my opinion, uh, again, it's my opinion that you know once you start getting into mid-size and large-size environments, the agent solution does not work very well. Uh, in a smaller environment, you can get away with it, no problems. Uh, in fact, uh, you may not even need any agents. Uh, uh, you, could, you, you could turn on native auditing and uh, you could deploy some free tools that are available to do that. Um, now, if you do think of using native auditing, then um, please be aware of these pitfalls. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, we already talked about the performance impact and the scalability and the inferior logs but you cannot easily segregate duties from the DBA because the native tools run inside of the database and the permissions are granted usually by the DBA. Okay, so you cannot segregate the duties. It's very hard. Uh, most of these tools, they don't provide the correlation for a series of events. They are just auditing tools. They're not really security tools. Uh, so every event is logged, but if you cannot understand patterns, even a simple pattern like you know multiple login failures followed by successful login, that's a pattern. It's a simple pattern. Or a SQL injection pattern, wherein 
you have multiple failed queries of low severity, okay, wherein uh, when I say low severity, it's basically because the object was not found, because the hacker does not exactly know the table name just yet, uh, or there's a typo, uh, because he's trying to use a, a single code to try to break in, and that effectively did not work. You're going to see a lot of failed queries followed if there's a successful attack by a successful query. So these kind of patterns have to be understood uh, and have, uh, and in auditing products and native auditing, these feature sets are simply not there. The third part of it is to discover and prevent database attacks um, uh, and be able to monitor the response content for sensitive data. You don't get that in uh, native auditing. Uh, how do you track a person when he's using a service account? Uh, we talked about uh, uh, you know, connection pools, for example, and the application connecting on behalf of the database user. The database native logs will never show you that information. Uh, how do you mask sensitive content? You know, that is either in the query, you may have a query which says, select star from this table where credit card number equals to one, two, three, four, five. Okay? And that credit card now is in clear text. It has to be masked. Almost all the regulations call for masking sensitive data. If it's in the response, it has to be masked as well. Uh, also, uh, instead of having a solution that is standalone, uh, it's a point solution, uh, how about thinking about integrating it into the larger picture, into your SIM environment with your log management and your enterprise alerting? Okay, we're going to talk a lot more about that today. Uh, so you will, with most of these tools, uh, if you try to do something on your own, you'll be left without central logging, you'll be left without central reporting, you'll be left without notifications. Okay. Uh, you'll be, you'll have to pretty much do all that yourself. So here's a, here's a very good slide. Actually, this slide is from Gartner. Uh, it's a relatively simple table, uh, but it, you know, it brings to, in the forefront, the, the problem that organizations are facing. Okay, one of the problems is, what database, mon uh, you know, what monitoring technology should I buy? And there's a myriad of them. And these are four listed over here. So this report says that, well, if you want to do, uh, if you want to monitor your environment, you definitely need a SIM because it is good at uh, system activity monitoring. Okay? But it's not good at database monitoring. So you need a DAM, a database activity monitoring solution. But if you're worried about file access or if you're worried about data leakage, you need a DLP because neither of the earlier two are good at that. Oh, but by, by the way, if you need fraud detection, uh, then you might need to get another solution. If you need to monitor file integrity, you need to get a FIM. And that list goes on. And this is where it starts getting unnerving for the organizations. You know, how do they spend the money? Where do they spend the money? And when you have all these point solutions, even if you can afford to buy them, when they don't talk and interact with each other correctly, uh, you are basically left with point solutions and a waste of money. Okay. Uh, because you'll have to run from one console to another console, and the information will simply not be integrated. So here's the concept that I would like you to think about, okay? integrating database security and, and your application security as part of your overall enterprise application security. And this is what organizations are already starting to do today. Okay. So here's a very simple concept, a very simple network, uh, wherein you see users accessing a database through an application tier, and there's a firewall at the perimeter. When you deploy your DAM, okay, uh, and it's part of the integrated SIM strategy, uh, when I say SIM, it's a security information event management, uh, uh, which can bring in data from pretty much anything. Uh, if DAM is part of that solution, then a DAM can be deployed either in agent form, uh, if that works for you, or uh, my preferred way, the network monitoring with a few agents if you need them. Then you can monitor all the activity going from the application tier to the database, but monitoring the SQL activity just is not enough for securing a database. Okay. You, are, you would also be worried about uh, you know, exploits that are coming from uh, external sources, like SQL injection attacks, buffer overflow attacks. So you need a solution that is in line. Now, how about utilizing your IPS that you probably already have in your environment? And if you don't, I would highly recommend that. Uh, to deploy the perimeter, who can block not only database exploits, but all kinds of other exploits? You know, a PDF exploit, for example. You don't need a, a separate database firewall or you know, a separate, very specialized appliance in between. So although you have the choice of taking the uh, DBM, which is monitoring on the network, and putting it in line, uh, why not utilize your IPS for the SQL injection monitoring? Uh, and leave the DBM, the network product, 
uh, not in line or you know offline. No, I won't say offline. Rather, not in line. Okay, or in IDS mode rather, because that way it's not uh, putting any latency on the traffic between the application server and the database server. Uh, as part of your strategy, uh, you also need to worry about monitoring the operating system on which the database servers are running. So you have to be worried about use cases where somebody logged on the database server through an RDP or SSH session. You have to be worried about the fact that somebody took a, a database backup and put it on a file system and then FTP it out of the server. All these things are real. You have to worry about somebody monitoring uh, or making changes to the registry setting. All of this, if it's not monitored, if you don't pick up the database OS events, then uh, you basically have a huge blind spot. Uh -huh. You also have to worry about, uh, you know, at some point you'll start worrying about when this important information in my sensitive databases makes it to my desktop. How am I going to prevent uh, that from leaking out? Okay, uh, you have a bunch of tools uh, that you can utilize. You can utilize DLP products or. Uh, at Nitro Security, we offer a product called Application Data Monitor, okay, which monitor, effectively monitors uh, chat sessions and web email and uh, you know uh, other protocols like P2P file sharing, which are typically used by malware or you know your file exchange programs. We monitor all of that for possible data leakage. So even the data, uh, when it moves from the database to your desktop, and it's accidentally sent out in a PDF, unencrypted, uh, uh, just maybe due to a bad business process or somebody making a, uh, a mistake. All of that stuff can be monitored and accounted for as part of your database security. Uh, the other part is then bringing all that information back into a console for the security team uh, you know, who has been tasked to monitor the database uh, because the DBS can't do it. Deploying appliances becomes a much simpler solution for the security team because they don't own the servers on which the database servers run. So instead of putting a hurdle in front of them, you know, by deploying software that somebody else has to effectively manage for them and send up their alerts as a service level agreement back to the security team. The security teams find it much better to be able to manage their own appliances. And when they're network appliances, the deployment process getting things up and running becomes very trivial. Okay? Uh, you, can, you can skirt out all the bureaucracy that will go on uh, if you have to go through uh, the application teams and the DBA teams and the security teams and uh, the system administrators and all of that. Okay. All that is avoided. And once all the information, not only from your database server, but from all your devices is flowing back into the same SIM solution, which is sitting at the top, you have the complete picture of what's going on in your environment, not just in your databases. And just like I said, the database security depends on monitoring what's going on at the IDS and IPS because there could be a SQL injection attack to your database coming from there, or a DBA or somebody taking a backup, uh, and that uh, ties in with your operating system event. So all of this, you can monitor all of this together in the SIM solution. Okay, and this is the integrated database and application security model that I'd like you to think about more and more. It is still not the same as uh, you know purchasing a SIM and then purchasing uh, a DAM from a specialized DAM vendor. Uh, that integration is is a very very important piece. Okay, and here are some of the reasons why. What are the benefits behind the tightly integrated SIM and a DAM solution? Okay. First of all, you get the correlation out of the box. Okay. The correlation, the engines, are typically found with SIM solutions and not with DAM vendors. Okay. So even a simple correlation rule that I showed you, like the brute force attack, okay, there are many complex correlation rules that you can create which are suitable for our environment, and that requires a correlation engine that comes with the SIM. You need to be able to monitor OS events. That kind of monitoring usually comes with the SIM. You need to be able to integrate with identity and access management solutions. That information comes with a SIM, uh, you know, wherein they're trying to figure out what resources or resource accounts, like administrator or you know, SA or whatever your uh, your cyber account name may be in Active Directory. Who does that tie to? Which individual does that tie to? Okay, is J Smith equal to John Smith in the marketing department? Should he be accessing the data? You cannot get that. These features are typically not found in DAM products. Uh, these are only in SIM products. Then about the VA integration. You have a choice to either either do vulnerability VA scanning 
for your entire enterprise for all the operating systems and all the databases in one pass using one solution from one vendor, or you can go out and purchase separate products from separate vendors. Of course, that the second bond becomes much harder to manage, right? So you want an enterprise-wide VA strategy, and guess where those VA tools report? They report back into the SIM, uh, and they provide the correlation up in the SIM. Uh, even the endpoint leakage products, uh, and in our case, we have also integrated the application monitoring and the IPS all into the SIM, okay, along with long-term data management for compliance purposes. Uh, so the long-term data storage that we're talking about, instead of having each point solution like a dam manage its own long-term archives, you utilize the logging infrastructure that a SIM provides. Okay? And when you have a tight integration, you can drill down between all the data very, very quickly, and we're going to see that in the product demonstration that follows. Uh, that when you have an event uh, and when you want to get on, get down into the session, you can do that relatively quickly. Okay? All the policy management becomes central to the SIM as well, okay? from one product uh, and from one interface. So here, let me quickly go through this uh, product demonstration, um, and we are going to follow the product demonstration as uh, part of the top use cases. First one being uh, privileged user activity monitoring. Okay. So in this screenshot, uh, what you see is the SIM, or in our case, the interface of the DAM, the database activity monitoring, is the SIM console itself. We only have one console. Everything reports into the SIM. Uh, you are seeing the audit trail of the DBA. So every single thing that the DBA does required by PCI and other regulations, not just the DDL activity, but even the every select statement that he issued has to be monitored. So we're talking about right from the time the person logs in till the time the person logs off, every single detail has to be captured if you want to effectively uh, get the reports that are compliant with your regulations. Uh, the second part to it is, uh, you know, as part of your reporting requirements, you will have to report back on typical DBA activity, like the DDL events, uh, the data definition changes that the DBAs typically make in the environment. Uh, many of these reports uh, in a dam solution like ours integrated in the SIM, of course, they'll be out of the box where you can report on, uh, you know, who the users were and what events they created. The other thing you'll notice is, uh, is the dashboards and the user interfaces in the SIM are typically much more advanced and much more sophisticated than you find in a standalone dam solution. The other use case is about database protection. Uh, so here I want to show you where the correlation engine, the power of the SIM, enhances the value of your audit trail that you've captured from a database product, okay? or your database logs, how they get enriched here, how to give you the information you actually need uh, for incidence response. So in this view, you know, there are lots of activities going on in all your busy servers, but it's only highlighting the kinds of attacks that your systems are vulnerable to when read, it's also highlighting, you know, that certain kinds of SQL injections are following, but you are, but they are still in yellow because they are your your systems are still not vulnerable to that attack. Uh, it's also showing you successful brute force login attempts and many correlation rules. Uh, so one of the things that comes with the SIM is a full asset management and severity management framework, wherein you can once you have defined what are your database servers, which ones have critical data in them. Uh, you know, the severities are managed by the SIM solution. You will also see the blues and reds, wherein the baselining of what is normal versus what is not normal, these kind of advanced features are typically found in a SIM. Uh, so you would definitely want the integration, your dam to reporting up in a SIM and not be standalone. Okay. Here's an example of a uh, simple rule, you know, that is out of the box. and how do you differentiate from a failed login versus a failed super user login? So here's an example where it says if the username is SA, and if any of the um, any of the response packets, they contain any of these numbers, okay? Now this is completely normalized data, so there is no chance of a false positive as would be reported by an IDS. In this case, we're looking for 18450, 18451, these are message numbers reported by SQL Server when a login fails. But by the way, the user was an SA, so this event is more important than a failed login from another user called Jay Smith. Okay. So these kind of things we'll find out of the box. Uh, you know, how do you detect fraud and policy violations? So here's a simple example wherein there's a rule that has been created. Uh, it says that PCI data has been accessed. 
Okay, and your rule is very simple. It's monitoring at the response content. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the you'll see the signature where it says response content equal to some reject expression. Okay, and it says that if this information is being accessed by anybody other than my application called Aura RPT, is my Aura report. It's okay if this application gets the data because it's supposed to. But if anybody else other than this application gets the data, then it is considered. Um, a policy PCI data access violation. Uh, here's another example uh, wherein you can actually see that you know somebody's been access the rule has fired and somebody's accessing the PCI data and he's running a query to like star from Trojan. Now if you were using a native auditing tool, you would if you would get if you report on a query select star from Trojan, uh, what sense does that really make? Because the native auditing was not able to report on the response that was coming back from this query. But in, in this in, in, in our tool or you know where we are actually monitoring the response as well as the query, you are able to alert on the fact that somebody requested PCI data uh, and which tables you got it from. Uh, here's another example uh, where you when you see something untoward at any time you can drill down into the detail of the event. Now this is important because a lot of sim vendors, especially vendors like us, we have spent extensive amount of time making our solutions highly, highly scalable to be able to deal with very, very large volumes of data. And that is what you will, you can expect even in a small to medium environment. You're going to have probably millions of events being logged in a single day. If you're a large customer like NASA, uh, you will be having billions of events logged in a day. Okay. Here's another example uh, of how you create these uh, uh, rules and customize these uh, rules in a policy editor. And you don't just do it for database, uh, uh, for your database policy, but you can do it for your operating systems and the entire environment. It makes it very, very convenient, a single policy editor. So here, if you're reporting on an unauthorized application accessing your data, how do you do that? A very simple rule which says, if your server name, if somebody's accessing my server, okay, so here the server name is equal to my server, but the application is not my application. A very simple rule like this it can alert you on when any application other than your application accesses your database server. Okay, a very simple and a very effective rule to monitor exceptions. Here's another example uh, wherein you see baselines. Okay, the baselines are effectively showing you that this is abnormal activity for user sys to be doing so many select statements. Now, just monitoring queries is not enough. If you don't have uh, information like this, wherein you are able to, if the tool is not able to tell you where is the anomaly, what should you be looking at, what is critical, what is different from what you normally see in your environment, then how good is it, uh, how are you going to be able to uh, spot uh, uh, anomalies in your system. Right? And baselines can be very important. And they're very hard uh, uh, when you are doing it programmatically, because when you have millions and millions of records in the system and you have to create baselines for every single event, it becomes a very tech technically challenging affair. Okay. Here's another example of uh, uh, the top consumers of sensitive data. Uh, I think we have already uh, uh, talked a little bit about this, wherein you want to be able to monitor, uh, uh, you know, the response content coming from the queries. Here's another example, and I alluded to the fact earlier where the subject matter expert, the people who know the application. Uh, the business owners, they need to participate in the security process along with the security team to improve the security posture because they're the ones who can easily understand and spot the anomalies. So in a SIM tool like ours uh, where the dam is just a component of the SIM, uh, you can create customized dashboards specific to your application. Uh, we, have a, we have customers today, uh, you know, who create these dashboards. Uh, for example, this one. Uh, is for the payments record application, wherein all the other activity that is not related to payment records is effectively hidden from the uh, from the subject matter expert, and all he all the only report or the dashboard, if he wants to see it in real time, he gets is the one you see on the screen, wherein he's seeing his payment record system, the users who are application that system, when they're accessing the system, and on the right hand he can see the kinds of events that are being reported up 
just for that application. And you can easily spot that there was an access denied attempt. And why was that access denied attempt? You can easily click on it and see the query that was responsible for it. Somebody is trying to delete from the patient uh, from the payment table where person ID was just 10,000. So these kind of things can, you know, even though you may have a lot of activity, you have to have the ability to filter things out relatively quickly. Okay. Uh, here's another example for how do you re uh, reduce the cost of breach notification reporting. Of course, that one is simple because, you know, the vendors have to provide uh, the reports, uh, many reports out of the box that you'll need. Now, uh, don't just think about reports as being binders of information that you have to submit to the auditor. It can be a very graphical and interactive report, okay? Uh, the dashboard uh, that is custom to you, which is your report, you don't have to send your binders to yourself. But there are certain kinds of activities you would like to see every morning or every week or every month. Uh, it may pertain to, you know, what changes have been made in my environment. Uh, you know, what is the abnormal activity that's happening, who's been accessing my sensitive data, and whether there was any anomalous uh, access towards that. All of that stuff has to be out of the box. Here are some other screenshots uh, uh, which go into the details of, uh, you know, how things should actually be monitored and why should database security or database events not be monitored in a silo by itself. So in this case, for example, uh, you know, we are monitoring operating system events alongside the database events for that SQL Server or that uh, Oracle Server, okay? So because it's also important to know that the DBAs or somebody else logged on the box locally, made changes to the configuration files. Oh, and by the way, the same user also did select statements against the table. It's all very important to be seen together uh, and not in different tools and different interfaces. Um, you know, when you deploy, uh, you sh your system should also be auto-discovering. Uh, like I said before, it's not just important to uh, discover the sensitive data, but it's also important to discover databases that may be out there that are being unmonitored. Uh, so your systems should be discovering stuff if, uh, automatically. If somebody opens up an illegal port to access a database server, you should be able to, this tool is supposed to be able to alert you on that fact, and all of that stuff has to be built into the product. Uh, the deployment has to be simple, which means if you, if your system can discover all the database servers uh, and with a single click you can start monitoring them, uh, then it makes your whole process of deployment very, very simple. Uh, a, you know, when you def uh, deploy agents, if you do in your environment, then that agent management process has to happen through the same interface. Uh, again, that makes your life and the total cost of ownership of the solutions uh, are much more palatable. Uh, there are many other features that we can talk about, you know, that you may want to look for. It may or may not apply to you. Uh, you know, there's a change control management feature, which the DBAs usually like. Um, the SOC people usually don't care about. Uh, but you must definitely, when you speak with your vendor, you should talk about uh, what application tracking tools that they have, right? We talked about the service accounts accessing a database server. There are many ways in which you can figure out who the application user was, and in some cases you may not be able to do that. But uh, the, uh, we should have sufficient tools in the toolkit, uh, and some of the examples are to be able to uh, track if there are any patterns uh, within the SQL queries that may help you identify the user. But, uh, you know, if your DAM is integrated with a SIM, you always have the option of also monitoring your application log alongside your database events. That is, in fact, that is a critical thing to do. That your application is, if it already records certain important events like somebody logging in or running an important transaction, like for example an SAP would do or your, you know, your custom application probably does it. You want to bring that event into the SIM. Uh, uh, okay. uh, there were many other uh, uh, ways in which you can track users. Uh, we just don't have the time to go through it today. Uh, but the other features you should be looking for is how do you amass sensitive data? You don't want to create your, make your SIM or your DAM a single point where the hackers may want to attack uh, and look for all the sensitive data. Uh, so your tool has to be, have the ability to properly mask them. Okay. Now, this is my last slide before I open it up for questions. Um, I get these kind of questions all the time uh, and I, you know, a very simple response. The question is, you know, we have decided we are going to buy a DAM solution. We think we need one to uh, improve our database security. Um, uh, is that enough? Will it do everything for us? 
And my answer is always no. Uh, you know, a dam is just one of the things that you want to buy to improve security. Uh, you already know about and heard about all the preventive tools that you may need. But let's, you know, even if you keep our argument just to monitoring, right, there are other controls that ha will complement your dam. And if you don't have these controls done correctly, your dam is not going to be effective. And here's a simple example wherein you, let's say, uh, you only have SQL servers in your environment, okay, on, on Windows. These are the recommendations I would make for you. One, not only use your DAM to monitor the SQL activity, but also monitor your operating system. So you monitor all the Windows event logs on the database server host, uh, because you want to know who's logging on and off and other things on the. You also want to make sure that you configure your SQL server correctly. Okay, uh, there are simple things that you can do which don't have performance impact, which can have a lot of benefit. Uh, one example is if you can turn on log on, successful and fail log on log off monitoring in your SQL Server. Okay, by default only the failed is uh, logged in. You also want to log the successful. It's a very simple change in the radio button. It doesn't have any impact. You must do it uh, because there are times when you monitor over the network. You, it is possible that your server system was down or it is possible there were some lost packets, or your network connection was not available. You know, things happen. Uh, you want to have a backup which is actually at least capturing some important things like, you know, we have a record that somebody did log on. You also always want to monitor your Active Directory because that is the place, the single place, where the services, where your users get authenticated. So the service tickets and uh, the user authentication events that are logged by Active Directory are very, very critical. They not only have the user information of who's requesting what service, they also have the original IP address of the user. Uh, uh, so even if you're on DHCP, you will know the IP address of that user as of uh, the time he was requesting the service. That becomes very important. And when you have all this information, a SIM is able to tie all this stuff together. Okay. Uh, if you are operating with a DAM, which is standalone, you don't have the ability to tie any of this information together. The other thing I would highly recommend is to deploy certificates on SQL servers. Now, for those of you on the call today uh, who, who know more, a lot about SQL servers, you probably know that SQL Server creates a certificate automatically every time it restarts, and it's a new certificate every single time. Now, that creates a problem because uh, if a DBA chooses to connect to a SQL Server using an encrypted session, all your activity will be completely unmonitored uh, because uh, you know you don't have any way to decrypt the traffic. Uh, the only way you uh, then you could have monitored the traffic was using native auditing, but native auditing uh, is something that most people don't like anyway. Now, how do you? Uh, so, what is the trick for at least for the important servers where they have critical data? You, we have to start getting into the habit of deploying certificates. Uh, even if you start off with self-signed certificates, it's a start. Um, and then share that certificate with your network-based DAM so that it can automatically decrypt the traffic on the wire. Okay, so even if a DBA is trying to bypass, we will be able to capture that, those events over the network. Uh, last couple of things. Uh, policies are very, very important, uh, and procedures are very important. Uh, whenever I walk into an, I've been with database groups for many, many years, uh, and I know that there are no reasons why the DBAs have to have system level privileges on the database servers. They don't need to. So you can limit their privileges. Uh, you can, in most cases, I advise that you even uh, not have any RDP access to the server uh, for the DBAs. Okay. Uh, by managing the policies that way, uh, by limiting their access, you can even circumvent deploying any agents on the local box because they are not allowed to run uh, SQL activity locally on the box. They can run it from their from their desktops so you can easily monitor it over the network. Okay. Uh, and my advice to you, uh, you know, if you're a small environment, agents will work out fine. If you're a larger environment, uh, sooner or later they'll become a headache. Uh, so even if you deploy agents, deploy a handful of them on only your most critical servers. The rest of it should be monitored over the network. And with that, I'm going to open it up for a few questions. Okay, Mel, thank you so much for that. We have a, a few minutes for, for questions here. I'll jump right into it. Here's one that just came in, Mel. When you find a SQL attack, what is the next step you should follow for remediation? Obviously, SQL attacks, I mean, they came out in the late 90s, but we're still seeing those being used to perpetrate a lot of breaches these days. 
So the standard thing that you would do for any kind of uh, remediation actions, uh, you know, you have to log a case and you have to follow it through. So when you f the when you follow it through, it requires you to start an investigation. Uh, your tools have to have the ability to provide the level of detail that you need to support your investigation. And a very easy example, a very simple example of that is that let's say. Uh, you know, your IDS alerted you of a potential SQL injection attack, which probably succeeded. Now, from the database layer, uh, if you don't have the granular logs, which tell you that, well, somebody did succeed in getting into the SQL server, from that same IP address, you also managed a successful query, which returned back 10,000 rows of data. If you don't have that level of granularity in your auditing, uh, then, uh, you know, how do you report back on the damage? So. You know, when you do your incidents uh, reporting, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you have all the supporting data that you can go back to and report upon. Um, um, next question, uh, and, and I'm not sure when this came in, what information the listener is referring to, but it says, this information is available <laughs> from the database SQL logs. If I'm sending those to a SIM, why would I need another device in line with the databases? Okay. Um, I guess that's. Can you can you repeat the question? Because there was some phone ringing here. I don't know which. Yeah, one. I don't know. Um, the, <clears throat> it says this information is available from the SQL logs. If I'm sending those to a SIM, why would I need another device to sit in line with the databases? And, and that really that really goes back to the slide that I presented before. That. Uh, you know, if you're okay with the inferiority of the logs, then you're okay. Uh, but there are certain kinds of things that you simply will not get from a native log that comes from SQL Server Oracle. For example, how do you monitor your response? That information is not in the logs. Uh, the DAM tools are much more sophisticated in, in the kind of reporting and the kind of granularity uh, of uh, metrics that they provide for your reporting purposes. Um, so in, in some cases, you know, where, uh, you know, it's not a very critical database, but you need a control around it, you might be just fine reporting back the audit trail from the SQL server uh, or from the Oracle, the native audit trail. Uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, if you need anything more sophisticated than that, uh, uh, then you're going to probably need a DAM. Okay. What, ti what, what timing are we, are we talking about here when it comes to deploying a SIM uh, DAM integrated solution? Well, usually, uh, you know, appliance-based products are much easier and faster to deploy uh, because you hook them up on the network and you, uh, you know, turn on the switch and off they are. So the first step in the configuration usually is uh, if it's a network-based product, then you have to do something called port spanning. Uh, port spanning is a relatively simple thing. Uh, it does need planning because the uh, network team uh, needs to know, you know, what segments your database servers are on uh, and which switches they have to span a port on. But it's a simple uh, operating, you know, it's a simple uh, iOS command once you know that my database servers are on these two VLANs and I need to be able to mirror that traffic on another port where I'm going to connect my DAM. It's usually as simple as that. In our case, you know, we usually have the customers do that beforehand, even before you walk into the door. So literally, we can walk in with the appliances and turn on the switches and we start monitoring the activity. It can be as fast as that if you're pre-planned. We'll end with a final question that has just come in. Um, apart from Active Directory, there is authentication that take, taking place some other, uh, that's a bit incoherent. Uh, does the RSA Secure ID uh, tool help in order to know which applications have been accessed? So is that something you can use in complement? Uh, you know, from a, uh, if you're a SIM uh, and you're authenticating through your uh, you know, through your VPNs and others, uh, uh, it's not to do with the RSA, but it's uh, in particular, but it's just a matter of bringing in information from all your sources where authentication, where people are joining your, uh, connecting to your network and being able to tie it together to be able to hop back and say that, you know, this is how, uh, uh, this is how the person proceeded to access the SQL Server or your database server. Yes, you can do that if you have a SIM and you have all the events. Uh, uh, you, you are not only going to need events from your logs, but you probably will also need events from your VPN devices and even flows, network flows, to be able to see, you know, to be able to trace back uh, 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 the path through which the systems have been accessed.
I got you. 30 seconds of final, for a final question here. Is database session data and log slash event data stored separately or together in the uh, Nitro View SIM product? Uh, well, uh, you know, there's event data and there's session data. So the event data is something that matches a rule. Uh, so, for example, a log on event or a log off event or somebody creating or dropping a table, usually th there are rules built out of the system, uh, out of the box. So that information usually makes it up straight into the sim. When you drill down and when you're talking about accessing session data, that means this is you're talking about every session of every user uh, on every database in your entire environment. You're talking about billions and billions and billions of rows. Uh, you could sometimes have billions uh, in just a day. Okay? So the way we manage that is through distributed management. Uh, the session data is typically kept on the DAM boxes, uh, and the event data flows up to the SIM. And this, the drill down from the event data to the session data is pretty much seamless, wherein the, uh, uh, the drill down action uh, fetches the data from your DAM device. Okay. So through distributed data management, we can uh, manage uh, all these events and sessions. Great, Mel. Well, thank you so much. There were a couple questions we were unable to get to. We will have uh, Mel uh, or someone from Nitro Security follow up with, with you guys individually. I have to stop here. Mel Shakir, CTO of Nitro Security, I want to thank you so much for taking us through this, uh, this very critical uh, issue for a lot of uh, organizations. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. And uh, to all of our listeners, I want to thank you guys. Within the next couple of hours, uh, the slides that uh, Mel uh, discussed today will be available on demand on the uh, Inside the SE uh, Magazine uh, virtual environment. So be sure to check those out. I know we got a couple of questions on that. I want to thank everyone for listening today, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.